All right, greetings, everybody. I think we can um, get started here as people continue filtering in. So I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. It's a joint webinar between Design Safe and STEER, Structural Engineering Extreme Events Reconnaissance. Um, I'm Scott Brandenburg. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UCLA and also the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion for the School of Engineering. And I'm part of the Design Safe team and coordinate with the ECO team to help bring you um, these sorts of webinars. Before we get started today, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the women and men in uniform who serve our country. Happy, happy Veterans Day to all of you, and uh, thank you very much for your service and sacrifices. So if, if you've attended a Design Safe webinar in the past, you probably recognize that this one's a little bit different. Um, rather than being a Zoom meeting, this one is now a Zoom webinar, which is actually better suited for this sort of activity. So. We're excited to give it a try. This is the first one using this new format. Um, so the way it'll work, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Uh, type them in there as we go, and then I'll help facilitate the uh, question answer session at the end. If you do have a question that you would prefer to ask out loud, I, you can raise your hand by clicking on the um, participants button at the bottom. And then uh, I can unmute you and call on you to ask a question at the end. Um, so I'd like to now introduce our speaker today. Uh, Tracy Kievsky Correa is the Leo E. and Patty Ruth Limbeck uh, Collegiate Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences, and also an Associate Professor of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. She's the inaugural director of the Structural Extreme Events Reconnaissance Network, STEER. And in this role, she's been an extremely active user of DesignSafe. Um, I just went through and counted all of her data sets and it's 39, so almost 40 data sets since uh, 2017 and probably over 20 just this year. Um, her most recent published data set was only three days ago on Hurricane Zeta. So she's really made a lot of use of DesignSafe. Um, these data sets, of course, represent the efforts of the whole STEER team that goes and does the reconnaissance work. And, um, you know, publication of field reconnaissance data is a relatively new development for the natural hazards community. In the past, we would go and do all of this work and publish reports, but the data themselves were often not available. So this is a really exciting um, change that's happening in natural hazards, and Tracy's been a real trailblazer in, uh, in this area. So given her extensive experience using DesignSafe to publish field data sets, we're really happy to have her here today to deliver this webinar. And Tracy, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you, Scott. And thanks to everyone um, in the DesignSafe team for the opportunity to be with you all today. Uh, thanks to everyone who's logged in and taken time in what I know is a, a busy culmination to the end of a semester under some stressful conditions for many of us. So, so thank you for being with us. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to present this um, presentation, this webinar today, on behalf of the Extreme Events uh, Reconnaissance Network, STEER, um, which as Scott indicated, I, I direct. And I'm hoping that some of our experiences uh, will help to guide all of you in moving forward in your use of Design Safe for publishing data related with this kind of field work. So this webinar today is gonna to overview STEER's approach to generating uh, reusable reconnaissance data that's compatible with DesignSafe's field research data model. And so specifically what I'd like to do today is I'm going to talk about, first of all, just some best practice in the collection of that data to make it reliable and high quality. I'm going to then move to how we document reconnaissance data to promote its reuse. Then we're gonna slide into the specific application of the field research data model in DesignSafe and then even talk about its capabilities for progressive curation of field research products, which often evolve over time. And I'll be positioning all of these objectives within the context of STEER as an extreme events reconnaissance organization. So I'll do a little bit of table setting just about us and how we work. So you can kind of see how this all fits in with our modes of operation. So, you know, for us at STEER, we see a natural hazard event shown by the number one here, for example, as a critical opportunity to generate knowledge on the performance of the built environment. That's our focus as an organization and how that affects in turn a community. And when these events happen, it gives us an opportunity through step two to conduct field observations. This initiates what we like to call steer the data to knowledge life cycle. That ideally should feed into step three, 
continued research and development that's going to address the vulnerabilities that we observed in our field observations and propose ideally mitigation strategies that ideally will then move through step four through our various regulatory processes and mechanisms here in the United States and abroad to reach those affected communities and come back full circle to complete the loop. Now that loop can take some time and often isn't well coordinated. So our goal in creating STEER with the National Science Foundation was to better coordinate and leverage the communities in research as well as policy and practice to streamline how we collect this data, not only in speeding that cycle, but then in creating new pathways through partnership to get the learning from field observations fed into the various points of the cycle much more quickly and especially back to affected communities. So what I wanna emphasize is that perishable data on how our infrastructure performs um, in practice is the lifeblood. It is the lifeblood of what we do in this life cycle and what we do at STEER. So when we set out to create STEER as a cross-cutting organization working across the hazards, we followed the inspiring example of our colleagues at GEAR and we launched STEER to work on how to be more intentional in this life cycle. And we, we kind of approached this in a three-pronged way. Most relevant to this webinar is the pillar of capacity. We really wanted to start thinking about how do we create standards for collecting, processing, and ultimately curating this kind of data in a consistent way. And part of the reason we made data such an important focus of how we build our organization is that we weren't out there to collect data to answer a specific hypothesis for a rapid award by an individual researcher, which was on the old NSF model. We didn't wanna create proprietary data for a given user. We wanted to work collectively across hundreds of users to create high quality communal data that can answer diverse questions and therefore be used um, in many faceted ways beyond our initial reconnaissance. And so today's webinar will focus on what we need to do in the data piece to make that possible. The webinar is going to use Hurricane Michael as an illustrative case study um, to just show you how we use the field research data model and the various facets of our approach. Um, this model or this event um, looked at the coastline um, right there where the landfall occurred, worked along the hazard gradient for wind and coastal hazards. We used a wide cross section of methodologies, which is why it's a good case study. Um, and we blended the methods of multiple teams. This was actually a STEER mission that also had a follow-on mission by the Rapid EF. You are welcome to take a look at this project. I have the project number and DOI available, and I think these slides will be shared afterwards. So you can take a look further to see the examples I'm gonna to underscore today by going in that curated data in DesignSafe. But before we talk about how to get that data to DesignSafe, we really wanna first just set the table to understand the importance of just getting high quality perishable data in the first place. Because if the data is not high quality um, from the onset, it's not gonna be useful then for curation and use by anyone else. So, you know, some of the things that we've experienced in our, in our two years of operating STEER, um, first of all, is just the importance of using good sound instruments for the data collection, especially when there's multiple investigators and on STEER missions, it's a lot of different investigators. So we focused on a standardized instrument in a mobile app. And we have the RAP at the Rapid EF. We initially started with Fulcrum, um, but regardless of the platform you use, that structured application is so critical for a number of reasons. The first of all, as we found, it's really important to allow a more complex and detailed assessment that is still easy to use because it's in a mobile platform. The structuring that you can then create within an app gives consistency, right? Every one of your investigators will move through the same fields. As you can see listed here, we have a number of fields that we assess as STEER, and this is gonna help make sure that every assessment comprehensively works through those. Obviously it reduces human error, and it gives that guidance along the way that makes sure the assessments are consistent in the way they're implemented. Most importantly, there's an automatic unification when you use these kind of apps between all of the responses in your assessment fields, the photographs you're taking, at STEER, we also use audio recordings from the investigator and even, you know, freeform notes or text. All of that's unified in a single geolocation and a single pin in the cloud database. So again, it really helps to synthesize everything in a very efficient way. And so, you know, what it means for us is that that immediate synchronization from a mobile app to a pin in a geo database really reduces the burden on the human in getting that data into a good format to curate later. And again, creates a nice standardized product that can be exported in a variety of formats that DesignSafe can then curate. 
So that's the first tip is just moving into standard instruments, ideally using a mobile platform um, to, to systematize that. Um, in STEER, we make all our apps available. So when you join STEER, you get access to all of our apps. They're all modeled off of existing assessment instruments. And so we have apps available for wind and earthquake and some new apps coming in 2021 that will give more detailed treatment for earthquakes and tsunamis. So in short, as a STEER member, you have access to all of our apps in the library. And regardless of whether you're on a STEER mission or not, we hope these apps and at least the instruments that we've created and the forms that back them would be a good model to use for any field investigator looking at the impacts to structures. But even when you have apps, there's a lot of human judgment in assessing structural performance. We all know this. And thus it was equally critical for us at STEER to create objective and consistent standards for identifying the features of different buildings and structures and for rating their performance or damage levels. And we found that one way to minimize subjectivity, if you will, is to focus on component rating of performance rather than overall damage ratings. Because if you look at how a component performs, let's say, as you can see in the example pulled onto this slide, this table, which is modeled after HAZUS uh, quantifications by Vickery et al, essentially lets you look at the performance of a given component, let's say the roof or wall cover, and know that the percentage of losses or damage to that component then map to specific global damage states. So if we can focus on helping our investigators quantify those percentage damage, damages or losses through an intelligent app with some guidance to remind them how to do that consistently, then we can easily map that component performance onto global damage states used by Hazus or any other platform for that regard. So it was really helpful for us to not only build apps, but to set out upfront some standards for how we rate and assess things so that everyone on our team is operating from a similar point of reference when they enter the field and know how the rating skills are being derived from certain component assessments. This document, our field assessment team handbook, um, is actually available on the STEER website in our resources tab so you can take a look at it to see the guidance we give our field teams on how to do these assessments more objectively. Then the next step in getting our data ready for curation is actually enriching it and quality controlling it. And this is a huge part. It's the part that nobody wants to do, right? Um, we have our field assessment structural teams in STEER. We call this the FAST. And then we have a virtual assessment structural team called the VAST. And they're working behind the scenes to support the field team and they are equally important. There's only so much data you can collect in the field. And so it's important to collect while you're on the ground the data that matters most that only you can see from the field. And the other data then should be augmented or enriched afterward by other members of the team. So in our app, we actually emphasize certain um, data that we call field priorities. And we ask our investigators on the FAST team to focus on those in addition to getting really good up close photos. The other fields on our app, and you can see through this slide where I'm showing how different ones are assessed by different members or combinations um, of our teams, the other fields then can be enriched and augmented by our virtual teams working in, in their homes, accessing the data from the cloud. And that lets us really be powerful in how we um, kind of segment our data collection so it's more efficient and it actually you know, meets the skill sets and resources of the different players on the team more effectively. And after we do all the enrichment and complete the damage assessment using a combination of virtual and field investigators, then we still have a review, an independent audit by data librarians who do a tiered quality control process. They step through and look at every record to make sure it's consistent with our standards in our handbook and make sure there aren't any omissions or gaps. So we're putting all the data through that quality control process in addition to enriching it. And that's a big part of what we do at STEER. When we're doing this, we have a lot of data that we leverage. And so again, it's not just about the field data, which is collected in our full Chrome mobile app, but we are getting things like the county records so that we can augment that with information about the building's year of construction and other details. If we are collecting data using rapid equipment from the rapid EF, we might be creating point clouds from our um, unmanned aerial vehicles. We might be taking street view 360 panoramas but all of that data is coming together for our virtual team to give them different perspectives and vantage points to view a structure. In addition to aerial imagery they might have from a range of sources. So what that lets them do, for example, when there's roof damage is see it from a perspective that the field investigator could not 
so they can make a better appraisal of the level of damage. And that's the power of using a virtual team to supplement what the field team can see because they have access at their computer to all these other data sources and really can then bring a real richness to the data. So that is the way that we've kind of approached it in STEER to make it more efficient. So there's a lot that goes in, as you can see, to just collecting and then enriching and quality controlling the data before we ever get to the moment of going to design safe. And the next step now, as we enter into the curation process for us at STEER is about documentation. One of the challenges is you collect this amazing data and then nobody knows how to use it or, or how you know, it was collected. So we then have a, a next phase in STEER that's focused on documentation. Our data reports are the first step in that process. And so in this segment of the webinar, I wanna just step you through what is our data report and how is it structured. It has six common um, standardized um, elements that you're gonna see here. Steps through everything from the mission and how we executed it all the way to how we created the folder structure in Design Safe. You can access this on Design Safe. This is curated in that Michael project. If you wanna look at the Michael report in detail, I'm gonna be using excerpts from this report in a step-by-step -step sequence of slides here to help you see what a data report is for STEER and why we hope it's a valuable asset for the community to be able to uh, reuse our data. So first off, First section of the um, report, the data report is entirely focused on just introducing the event. Relevant information about the hazards um, and what the event was, our strategy for response, and all the different sub teams that we're using uh, to deploy and respond in that mission. So you can see that here. One of the things we always include is our data librarians, the people who are working behind the scenes and quality controlling the data. Again, that's a signal, their inclusion in the authorship is equal importance given to their work on the backside as much as the field investigators who were collecting that data. So we kick off the report with just introducing all those players and the mission approach. The second part of the report is focused on the data collection methodology. In this section, we have a subsection dedicated to each of the platforms that we're using for data collection. We're telling you the hardware that we're using, the resolutions that we're using, how it was implemented and executed in the field, sampling rates, all of those things. Any relevant settings are reported here. So you can see on this excerpt that I'm showing from Michael, this is an example of the use of applied street view and we explain the hardware that was used in that execution, um, leveraging the rapid EFs equipment. We also include in this section a reminder at the header of each subsection, who was executing that, which sub teams, and any ways that they can access the data. We curate our data actually multiple ways, not just in Design Safe, but in some other real time venues. So, for Street View data, we would be including that, for example, on Google Street View. And we found that FEMA, for example, finds that very useful to use our data in their event responses. And so, we make it available immediately using those kind of platforms. We also often include in this section, when we're talking about things like Street View, even showing the route maps. So people understand uh, what specific routes we drove on what days through what parts of the affected area. Section three is a very brief section, but it serves as a tabular summary or a recap that just shows us the locales and dates sequentially that were engaged by which members of the team and reminds the reader then of what hardware was engaged at what point. So as they enter the data, they know the timing and temporal nature of that data collection. By time we move to the fourth section of the report, it is a mirror image of the second section, meaning that now it is dedicated to showing the user how the data collected with each hardware platform that we previously introduced was then subsequently um, post-processed. So this explains software packages that were used, the different data products that were derived out of the raw data, and any form of quality control that was executed in that process. Um, you can see, for example, here, we focused on the Applied Street View, where we are providing language to explain how Applied Street View data is processed and how those panoramas are stitched together and viewed uh, through some of the standard software used by the Rapid EF. Section five is probably the most important section of the document because it is the one that actually shows you how to use our data and make sense of what you find in Design Safe. So what we do in this section is we organize the data in such a way that there is a, a folder dedicated to each data class, um, each type of assessment technology or methodology. And then this section steps through each of those folders, introduces their name, explains, as you can see in the header, 
The formats of the various files that you're going to find in that folder on Design Safe explains the conventions for naming folders and, and directories or other um, files within each folder. So people get a really good impression of how the data is organized and therefore can make informed decisions when they access the data about which um, elements of our data set they'd like to use. When we're going through this process, as this um, other part of this section shows, we want to emphasize that we also curate both of our raw data and process data. So in this screen capture, I'm showing you that when I talk about something like our unmanned aerial surveys, we are going to be curating all of the uh, image, images that were collected in, in the grid when they did that survey, as well as the derived products, such as the point cloud that was derived out of it. So in this example you see here, this section five would even include a table where we would take you through each folder um, in a given data set and tell you, for example, how many raw files you will find in the original form, um, sometimes in the thousands, and then a second folder that contains all the process data products that were derived from that raw data uh, following the post-processing protocols described in section four. You will also see in these tables, we provide a description of the site so people know the Latin long of the location where this uh, survey was conducted and some of the relevant details of what they will find um, when they look at this unmanned aerial survey and its derived products. The last part of our report, at least the last formal section, section six is contact. Seems like a trivial thing, but we also include a point of contact for a person in our team for every part of the data or data collection methodology. So that this way, if someone has a question on a certain part of the surveys or the data set, they know who to reach out to for questions. And we make our team members available um, to answer any questions or concerns. Our reports always close then with a set of appendices. And the appendices really for us apply to helping our users interpret what is inside of our damage assessments. You know, as STEER, one of the major things we do using those mobile apps is collect detailed damage assessments on individual structures buildings and non-buildings, such as towers, for example, or um, other pieces of infrastructure. So in the example you see here, we have an appendix then dedicated to each of those apps where we step through what you will find in the database that's deposited in DesignSafe. What is in each column entry? What is the name of that field? What is the format that it's in? As well as the description of the possible responses or response choices you would find in that field as well as a summary of the percentage of population, meaning how many times is that field left blank, or in other words, how many times is it completed? We work to complete all of our fields 100% when possible, but we also report to you when you should expect to find some gaps based on missing information. So that's also compiled in a set of appendices. At the end of the day, for a mission like Michael, as complex as it was, this report is actually 50 pages long but it creates a guided document that helps a user be able to come in and at least access relevant parts of our data, understand how it was captured, how it was processed, and how it appears in Design Safe. So now what we want to do, um, and apologies for my, my words getting uh, cut over when it rendered here on the slide, we want to engage now the field research data model. We want to help illustrate now that we have collected high quality data. We've documented it now with a thorough report we're gonna now move into the stage um, of the curation process where we're moving into Design Safe to actually organize that data and expose it for all of you. So in this section of the talk, we're gonna look at how to organize multi-phase investigations with different instruments and teams and provide some tips on how to enhance the discoverability and you know, value of the published data using these new data models in Design Safe. So um, as we are known for in STEER, we make guidance documents to support all that we do. And in this part of the webinar, I'll be talking about a document called our Product Curation Handbook. This handbook was written to basically help all of our users understand how STEER engages Design Safe and its curation and publication workflows for managing our data. This handbook, like the others I'm talking about in today's webinar, is available at the STEER website under our resources tab. And it has step-by-step -step guidance for how to use the field data research model for briefings, reports, and data sets, as we're going to illustrate now in the case of Michael. So we hope that you will find value in that resource. I will give some highlights, but it's quite a rich document that you can consult after this webinar. So first of all, a few things to keep in mind in setting up your 
project header or the, you know, the project itself in DesignSafe. Uh, first thing, of course, is being exhaustive with the personnel that are defined in the project header, whether they be PIs, uh, actual project members who have a design safe account, or unregistered members who do not have a design safe account. What I want to emphasize here is this project membership on our header includes everyone who touches the data, from the people who collect it in the field, to the people who process it, to the people who do the quality control. They're all included in this collection because we need to have them included here as uh, members of the team so that we can give them authorship later. So that, um, that is the first you know, piece of advice. The second piece of advice, you know, the rest of the setup here is fairly straightforward, is just the importance of keywords. Um, Design Safe you know, gives you an opportunity to search, right? You can query published data sets by keyword. And we think that that's a really important part of somebody discovering your data. So as a team, really think about what to include in those keywords to maximize the possibility that someone finds your data. For STEER, we do a couple of things. We always, we always include in our keywords, the event type, the hazard class, if you will, the name of the event, um, something about the location, whether it be the state or city or country, um, and then some of them, a couple keywords about the assessment types or methodologies that we used in that mission. Most people, if they're going to go on DesignSafe and look for data, they're going to search if it's reconnaissance data, they'll search by the event name, right? So at minimum, having the event name as a keyword will increase the possibility that someone finds your data. But we also encourage, you know, expanding that a bit using some of the guidance that we have um, here under STEER. But I think the keywords are so critical and they're often overlooked. The second thing that we encourage as you move into the design safe product curation kind of workflow is just thinking about folder structure and how important folder structure matters for people making sense of your data. So we have a very consistent approach to organizing our data in design safe and we have a folder structure that we try to use consistently in all our projects. Uh, the first thing that we do is we number all of our directories sequentially that just helps us sequence the files better and then um, as you can see then they organize around certain clusters for different methodologies. So I'll point out a few noteworthy ones. The first is our, our kind of core directory on D0 is all of our planning documents. That includes everything we use to plan the mission, including the briefings for our teams. We publish that and I'll explain to you why that's a really critical part shortly. The second thing we do is we group together common um, methodologies in related numbering sequences. So for example, we always have directories dedicated to the outputs from our mobile apps. And we have three mobile apps that can be used in a wind mission like Michael. So we'll number those as D11, D12, and D13. So the user again has an understanding that these are all related. They're all from the mobile app, but they are you know, from different survey instruments, if you will, and different um, questionnaires or fields were completed for those. So that's another way that we signal that through our folder numbering. The third way that we use folder numbering is we often have data collected by a similar you know, methodology, let's say using unmanned aerial vehicles, but by different hardware with different intents or purposes or teams. So we'll actually use our folder structure to reflect that. And so here you see in Michael, we have D31 and D32. Those are both unmanned aerial vehicles, but one would say steer and the other would say rapid EF to signal different users and different hardware who created that data. And so um, that gives us a way to organize intelligently, if you will, using numbering sequences, how data is related. And that's reflected in our folder structures. The last is you know, D8. Um, D8 is a directory where we actually even include things like our daily summaries. Our teams write their kind of reflections each night. We include that kind of raw impressional data in our data set as folder D8. And then of course we have our data report that does not go in any folder but sits in the primary root directory because the data report as you saw in the previous part of this webinar is literally the roadmap right for the entire data set and so we keep it out there in the root once we move into the process of then now starting to sequence these directories through the field research data model we're going to now move you through that sequence to show you how we actually engage the model and use it and this sequence is in our handbook. So if you go and read that handbook on the STEER website, you'll see all the details on how to do this. We have instructions written for every class of data collection STEER makes. So you can always go read those. I'll be using one example in each of these slides just for an illustration. 
So the first step in using the field research data model is just defining the missions. And at STEER, we interpret missions as a way to signal that this data was collected by a specific subteam that had a specific focus, possibly working on specific dates in a given locale. But it defines a team with a given scope of work, part of our larger team. So we use it as a subteam designation. So for Michael, as an example, we had STEER members go out as part of our FAST, our field assessment structural team in October. That was the first mission we set up. And then the Rapid EF did a second mission in November and they were dedicated as a separate mission. And so that gives you an example of how we interpret mission for our purposes. And when creating these missions, you know, I have some guidance here, but it's fairly straightforward. Um, for us, the data report is such an integral part of how we create the mission because as you can see, the mission includes a mission description. And by writing up that data report, we can extract language then from sections one and two, for example, to clearly articulate then the missions of each of the subteams. So our data report fuels a lot of the fields that we populate as we move through the mission um, definition phase. The other thing I wanna signal is when you're setting up your missions, you get to assign authorship. So all of those individuals who were on the project header at the beginning, now you can come and check which ones were actually part of a given mission. And this is critical because that's how you're gonna assign authorship later when you publish the DOI. When we're checking members to include on a mission, I wanna emphasize that we again include both the field researchers as well as the people who did the enrichment virtually on the backside. Quality control, all of that extra process that happens back home, if you will, those people are included when we define the missions um, for these teams. The next step then is we use collections. And collections are used for us as a way to then designate all the different methodologies that our teams were using um, in their mission. So the collections can be, in the case of Michael, quite extensive, as you can see here. Because the Rapid EF and STEER use different hardware to conduct similar assessments, you'll see that our list of collections defined for Michael actually has them designated by who collected them. So you'll see in an example here, you know, there was unmanned aerial surveys conducted by both STEER and the Rapid EF. Those are separate collections because they use different hardware with different personnel on different dates. And you can see that there's two types of collections included. The ones that are listed in gold are these engineering geosciences collections. Those are the traditional data that we think about when we do field work. But we also have a couple collections defined of another class that's shown in the green here. Those are these um, research planning collections. And for us, those again are the documents we use to plan our missions, as well as our data report. We treat that as, a, as an example of a planning collection since it has our strategy outlined. And I'll note that the field research data model requires you to have these kinds of uh, documentations or planning collections attached to the mission. So you actually need both. It's an encouragement to have both. And so you'll see in all of ours, we'll have a combination of gold um, as well as the green ones, the planning collections in our data set since both are required. When we're making our collections, again, like I said, each of the collections is dedicated to a specific data collection methodology or approach. So the title that we use in defining a collection is descriptively created to make that clear. So here you can see in the dropdown, we're, we're saying that it's the steer street view data. And that title alone gives a clear designation of what kind of data it was. Um, and then we have again, the ability as we work through the fields to assign authorship. So who was involved in the collection of that data? That actually is then signaled by checking the boxes here. And it's distinct from the mission. The mission is everyone involved in the mission. The collection is who collected that actual data. So it's a smaller subset of the authorship that's checked off in this phase. So you can see in this example for Applied Street View, only Daniel Smith and John Cleary are shown as the data collectors. Those were the only two boxes I checked because those were the two gentlemen who actually collected this steer data in Michael. You'll also see that in this process, you have an opportunity to tag um, several categories of metadata. Um, those are shown in red. The observation type, there's a drop down to let you pick what kind of observations, wind, structural, storm surge, those would be checked off based on some choices available in the data model. You also have an equipment drop down that lets you pick some predefined um, categories of equipment that was used in the collection. So the, the design safe model gives you both some choices to select through drop downs for equipment and observations. 
and then prompts you for other fields that are, you know, describing the, the data collection um, in terms of location and dates, et cetera. You'll note I'm using two different colors in the guidance on this slide, and that's to also signal that not all of these fields are required for all collections. For a, for a documentation collection, such as our mission planning um, you know, collections, for those collections, we're not required to have anything shown in red. So we have a larger, more expansive list of metadata attached by uh, design, you know, by the data model. For the engineering sciences collection, because they involve specific locations, dates, and hardware, for the other collections that are not about field data collection, um, but actually about documentation supporting it, the red fields shown in this slide would not be required. And once your collections are set, so you have missions defining your teams, collections defining the methodologies they're engaging. Now we've got to create a relationship between all of those to create logic and structure to our data within the project. And so you, after you kind of build all these out, we now get into a process of tagging. So when you move into your directory and design safe, and I'm showing a screen capture here on the right from Michael, each of your folders that you've created now that contains data are gonna to have to be assigned a collection. So there's a select a collection um, dropdown and you can go and select any of the collections you've defined and attach it to that folder. So you can see here, I attach my detailed damage assessment collection to this particular folder. Then you have the option to start putting tags on that, additional metadata, if you will. And so the tags come from a predefined list. You can see a drop down here that gives you choices for tags, and you can have multiple tags, even multiple collections on any given folder. For STEER, what we did is we predefined the tags that we would associate with each type of data that we collect. Um, in some cases, we use the other. Um, there's an other choice nested in this drop down menu to define custom tags when we found that the pre populated tags did not um, adequately represent perhaps that particular class of data. But we've defined all these in our handbook so that every time we publish data of a certain type, such as a building assessment, they're gonna be tagged the same way for consistency. So if, for example, when we're doing a damage assessment on a building or non-building structure, we will tag it with these four tags, structural observation, forensic, on the ground, using images. And from those tags alone, without reading our data report, a user would therefore know how this data was collected and that it's based on images uh, collected on the ground. And that's kind of the value of the tags. It's a quick way to put essential information into the data structure itself without having to engage the report to learn all of that information. Once you have your collections and missions all set up and you've tagged your various directories, there's a process of just relating all of those and making sure they're structured accordingly. So when you look at the relate data pop-up, you'll start to see after you've done all your tagging, your mission, then showing all the different collections that organize under that mission and all the different folders that are now associated with those collections under that mission. So you can see here in the screen capture now, my STEER team, you can clearly see what collections they gathered including the research planning collections, the planning documents they used. And you can see the Rapid EF has a similar configuration for the data they collected. The little arrows off to the right, a little hard to see, I know, but if you hit those up and down, you can actually order the collections. And so in STEER, we actually order those to match the way that they appear in our directory structure and in our reports, so that we're sequencing them um, kind of numerically the way that we number our folders. And you can see from this visual that both of these missions do include both a research planning collection, some kind of document explaining the mission. Our data report serves that function at minimum. And then we also then have the data itself, which are shown in the gold collections under each of the missions. Um, and so that is kind of how that data relationship then looks to the user. After you've got your data related and all connected in the data model, it's time now to move into the publication workflow, which I found is fairly straightforward um, for myself as a user. Because each you know, um, mission has different people involved, they each receive their own citation, and that's a really important um, value that the field research data model at DesignSafe creates. So you can see here, when I was building out the mission for STEER and getting ready to publish the STEER team's um, products, we are able to then be able to signal who is a part of that team, including the data collectors, as well as everyone who supported the mission. But then we have to assign authorship. And that has to be something you as a team decide in advance so that there's a clarity around how you're gonna give first author. 
And it's good to establish that up front. You know, STEER uses the following model as our model for guiding how to do that. But basically our priority is the following. We take the person who led the mission on the ground first, then we follow it with the people who enforced the data standards and coordinated the mission at the backside. And then all the members who supported the field data collection followed by the people who did the quality control and enrichment. And if there's any other additional people who wrote up documentation, they're last in the order of authorship. I'm um, using alphabetical order within each of these subgroups, but that's kind of the sequencing of our authorship. And we try to make that very clear so that it ensures the citation that appears reflects the ordering of the authors, which you will control in the publication workflow to, to kind of model or capture what you wanted to signal and what you believe is appropriate uh, recognition of uh, value and effort among the team. So you'll notice on this slide, while the author shown here on the header of the project, over there on the upper right shows a different order. In the publication process, you can correct that order to reflect the standards you've created as a team for who will get first, second, and third author. And this is how kind of STEER approaches that. And I, I encourage all teams to do something similar so there's transparency around that. So now I wanna just talk about progressive curation. I think this is the real beauty of this model. So I'm gonna close with this last little piece of information. You know, field data evolves over time. And what I found to be really helpful about this data model is that it lets you publish things progressively, but all under a single project. In many cases in STEER, for example, we are pushing products out in waves and we'd like to be able to publish them progressively. And this model is really tailored for that. So I highly want to encourage you, whether you're doing virtual reconnaissance that never actually goes to the field, or whether you're doing a combination that involves field and virtual or 100% field, Anytime you're doing something related to reconnaissance and actual observations of our built infrastructure after an event, please use the field research data model. It is perfectly tailored and the more we all use it, the more we're gonna create value around it. And I wanna show you then how you can use it to even phase publication over time. This has been a really great value. And unfortunately, Michael happened before all these features were available. So I wanna demonstrate this particular feature using a different mission. This is our Nashville tornado mission, which was a 2020 event. And it kind of used the data model from front to back. So it's a great example. When STEER um, deploys after an event uh, in the community, we have sometimes three products that will come out. A preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. We call that the PVRR. It is then followed by an early access reconnaissance report based on field observations. And then the full quality control data set comes at some time later after it clears all the quality control. So there's a time delay between each of the products. But with this model, we can actually publish them sequentially under the same project. So what I'll do as a leader in STEER is I will start creating missions for each of these products. So as soon as our preliminary report is ready from our virtual team, that becomes a mission. And it becomes a document collection, a new type of collection that's shown in gray. Um, because it is basically 100% virtual work. That gets a separate set of tags and a separate kind of collection classification that STEER has its, in its documentation. You can read more about it. Then a couple of weeks later, the field team's observations were written up and their early access report was ready to go. I had a new mission I created for them and was able to relate that data under the project now with a new documents collection that had their report. And then when their data was all in and quality controlled, we had a third mission we were able to create that contained all the actual data. So this is available on Design if you wanna check it out, but this just shows an example of how we could progressively phase out the data and the products over time. And then each of these importantly, receives its own citation with its own DOI as it's published in you know, real time over time. And each of those has a unique authorship because the people involved change in a steer mission from week to week sometimes as they join us for different products, but not all the way through all three. And that gives us the flexibility to recognize the unique authorship on every product with a unique DOI, but still have them all captured in the same design safe project, which is a really nice umbrella for our work. So in closing, you know, STEER was really hoping to be distinctive in the way we approach field reconnaissance, to be able to respond really swiftly to events and get in the field early, to be very efficient using our virtual teams to help us get our data collected much faster. But we really do believe that impact is delivered from the data itself. 
And the emphasis on data standards, quality control, and curating data in a way that it can be reused by others is where we're really working hard to try to create um, a new standard for our community and help drive practice in that area. So I hope that our webinar today was a clear commitment at minimum of our hope to do this and, and do it better. I also wanna make sure to emphasize that, and as you could see, curating data is a lot of work and we need to create value around published data. And that means being good producers of published data as well as good consumers. You know, in short, we have to be good data citizens. And for us to get recognition for all this hard work means that we all have to do our part. Design Safe circulated this tip, set of tips. I really want to emphasize these in closing here today. Cite your published data sets in your references with the full citation and DOI. It's so critical to do this in your papers. If you have a data paper, be sure to cite the data paper and the data set. Do both so that they both get value and recognition. In your presentations, talk about the availability of the data and give people the DOI. We should start getting the word out at conferences and creating value, not just around results, but around the data that enabled those results. And push it as a contribution with your dean, your chair, your committees on appointment and tenure. They need to see this in your CV. They need to see it on your profiles. You need to be pushing it as proudly as you promote when a new paper is published. You need to promote when your data is published. And these are the things that you know, I think we need to be doing to create real value. So with that, I'd like to close by acknowledging NSF for funding us, obviously, to all the extreme events reconnaissance and research teams that are under Converge for all of their guidance. We work together to get better every day at this. And Design Safe is so critical to our mission of coordination and data collection and curation. So we want to especially recognize them and all our, of our EER friends under Converge. We want to thank Fulcrum um, Spatial Networks for the mobile app that we showed you today. But most importantly for the STEER members, they do all this hard work. And um, you know, they make our job then of getting the word out about this work um, easy because they're so amazing. And so with that, I invite you to come to STEER's website to learn more. Go to the resources tab to see the handbooks on all the stuff I talked about today. And if you're not a member, please join and you'll have access to all our apps um, so you can start using them or at least learning about them in your own field work. Um, so Scott, I'll, I'll stop here and, and take any questions um, if folks are interested. All right, thanks a lot. Unfortunately, I can't figure out how to unmute everybody so they can all clap for you. So I'll just give you a round of applause um, on behalf of everybody. I think that was a wonderful presentation. So thanks for that. Uh, we do have some questions that are coming in. Um, they're coming in both the chat and the Q&A. So I'll try and ask them in the order they arrived. Okay. So first on slide nine, table two, the question is, um, sometimes when there is minor building envelope damage, there is significant interior water damage. How is this scenario accounted for? Well, that, that's an excellent one. And, and you, you know this better uh, than anybody, but this is something that we now recognize we need to do. So in short, it is not accounted for well right now in the existing damage assessment instruments. So what we're doing is doing a revamp. STEER is going into its next phase of funding, hopefully from NSF, where we're going to revamp our um, data collection and our damage assessments to parse out losses, including interior losses, from structural damage to make sure we're trying to capture both. Sometimes the biggest challenge, as you know, with interior is that we can't get inside. And so we have to even judge that from some of the other evidence we collect, such as the debris piles in front of the structure. So we're trying to do better in that regard. But unfortunately, right now, the existing instruments really focus on external views and things that can be easily related to structural damage. So in short, we're going to be adding more losses categories to try to capture those better in the future because we know that's what's driving the dollars. All right, great. Thank you. And I'll remind everybody, if you have a question you want to ask out loud, uh, you can raise your hand using the participants view and I think I can allow you to speak. But before then, I'll keep reading the questions that have come into the Q&A. So the next question, this was a very inf informational webinar. Thank you. I have two questions. How is the region identified for field observations and is the data only collected for damaged buildings in that region? Wow. One of the utilities of these data would be to refine fragility and vulnerability functions, but only if a subset of damaged buildings is collected, it can be difficult to estimate the observed probabilities of damage. Yes. Um, so I can, and I can grab, like, grab both. I can see I've got the Q&A up here so I can read it. Oh, um, so I pulled some of that out because I was trying to focus on curation for our friends at Design Safe. That was kind of the intent, but I had a slide on this. 
The answer is we identify clusters based on the inventory data. So where we think there's something to learn based on the age of construction and the building type. But then once we get into a cluster, we sample every third building so that we're getting damaged, undamaged, if you will, so that we can start to reconstruct those probabilities of, of damage, as you noted, so that we can get to that, you know, important empirical data that would inform fragility descriptions. And we do this across the hazard gradient. So as you saw it in the Michael example, we're working across the wind field or across the inundation zone to be able to look at how that also varies with hazard intensity. So we're doing both in the mission design um, to do our best to create something that has use for the application that you noted. Um, other infrastructure, the answer is yes on that front as well. Um, yes, most of our teams are really interested in buildings. Most people are building spokes, I would admit. But we also have an app that's dedicated to non-buildings that does things like utilities and other forms of infrastructure. What I will say has actually been the most valuable in that regard for STEER is our street view data. For example, Hurricane Laura, we drove over 600 miles of street. So you could see every pole and utility kind of performance along that pathway. That's data we hope people will start mining to look at things like infrastructure performance. Then we swept those entire routes again after Delta so we actually have then chronological or longitudinal benchmarking of that data. So I think our street view rather than our apps will be the value add in that regard. Um, so we do include it, um, but I think you'd be using our street view data to make better inferences on the second point. All right, great, thank you. Um, then there's, yeah, there's a question about, uh, is there an example where steer reporter data set has helped emergency managers in the short term? Yeah, it was Laura. Laura's the best one, though right now I will say in Turkey, our briefing is being presented to local officials as they start tagging. So it depends on the event, but Laura was a great example. FEMA was at reduced capacity and couldn't deploy in full strength. They found out we were collecting Street View and we made a commitment to publish it to um, Google Street Maps as we were getting it. So they were actually using it to start doing some of their FEMA map work because they couldn't get on the ground um, due to their staffing and some of the COVID issues. So that was a really cool one that also happened in the Bahamas. Um, we were able to help with Dorian by making the data available. And that's the cool part. We can use design safe for long-term preservation, but then we prop up when needed kind of real-time access through our Fulcrum platform, through Street View, through servers that are run by the Rapid EF. So people who are in the middle of response and making critical decisions actually can consume the data in almost real time. All right, great. Um, and then David Frost asks, how does the process presented today integrate with a mission, no mission decision? I guess that means whether you go up to investigate a particular hazard. Yeah, I mean, from the purposes of data collection for us, um, we do a lot of virtual reconnaissance as STEER, which is why I have so many products on Design Safe. Um, you know, we're responding to three events right now, all virtual, especially because of COVID. So I guess our go, no go these days is also largely confined um, to feed, you know, it's, it's field team is, is ultimately the one that we are pulling back more selectively because of the travel bans and COVID issues. But we're still publishing virtual um, or street view data sets where somebody just collects it in a car safely, but then shares it with everyone to do virtual assessments. So we're engaging the same publication workflow in Design Safe, but just with a different set of products with street view being the most common field data these days because of COVID. Um, but same platforms are used even for our virtual responses, which are the majority, uh, especially now. All right, great. Then the next question, does STEER plan to backpopulate data from prior historical events? And if so, to what degree? And can, they, can such work be done by virtual um, reconnaissance teams in response to future disasters? That would be amazing. I mean, I think, you know, we would probably have some issues with sparse data because I imagine that not all the fields that we normally collect on a damage assessment were collected in that uh, historical data, but I think it could be a really cool community initiative to have almost like a hackathon where we get together and take legacy data and bring it in. So I would love doing that. That'd be awesome. And then how do you select the members of the reconnaissance team? I guess that would be both the field assessment team and the virtual assessment team. Yeah. So what we do is we put a call for participation out. And then the, the call for participation, people register to say whether or not they'd be interested in deploying. You will see some repetition in the teams lately because one of the other factors we've had to consider, especially with COVID, is regionality. We can't put people on planes right now. 
So for the hurricanes, we decided that if you're in driving distance and you can stay in your own car and collect data, you can go collect data in your region. So the Southeast has had a lot of repeat offenders, if you will, in our teams, because they're literally close enough to survey Alabama, Louisiana after our hurricanes. But it's based on who volunteers. We send an email out to all members. And then based on who volunteers, we can configure teams. I will just say that in 2020 with COVID, since the Nashville tornadoes, we've had to dial back who participates because we can only do people in the region because we're trying to minimize hotel stays, airplane and exposure. And so it really has become regional responses for people in the regional hotbeds. Uh, similar to Turkey, we're relying on regional uh, folks to collect data and share it back with us. So that's why it looks a little bit uh, repetitive in terms of team configuration, especially in 2020. All right, great. I, I have a question too about um, Fulcrum and the uh, Nary Rapid facility because they have an app too that's intended to gather field data. So um, I guess my question about Fulcrum is, do you publish those products directly in as part of these projects? And then does somebody need the Fulcrum app in order to view those products? Nope. So, you know, basically we're working with the Rapid EF to do a migration over to the RAP. There's some features they're bringing online in what will be their new mobile app version that's, you know, available in the, in the iPhone or iTunes um, you know, store that you can download. So once that's kind of in that format and has all the features we need, we're working on that migration. Um, but Fulcrum, just in short, if you want to use their web visualization, it's nice to log in as a Fulcrum user, user and play with it. But everything we publish in DesignSafe is set up standalone, so you can access that data um, because it's exported out as a standalone data set. So you can kind of have your, your pick. A lot of people just like the visualization capability in Fulcrum because they can kind of go to pins and click on them and see things. And so I think one of the things we're going to be working with DesignSafe on is to figure out how to create a visualization, you know, back end, if you will, for our data when it comes from the wrap. So it has that same level of geospatial visualization uh, for our users, because I think they do enjoy that. Right. Great. Thanks. Then there was one more question that came through the chat. Um, is there any demo on how to navigate data in Design Safe from a user's point of view? And then if we do detailed case studies, can we publish those data as well? Yeah. And I think you know that becomes really interesting. So uh, first of all, definitely encourage you to publish that data, especially if you use it for some purpose. In the publication process, when you set up the project, there's a way to relate other data sets or other projects to your project. So I'd say one thing we should all start doing is as we derive something from one data set, include it in your project header to show that this is dependent on the data that I got from Steer, for example, and that creates a nice family tree of how our data is being reused. So that would just be a, a great, you know, good citizenship move for us as a community. Um, but the second is navigating the data, I think is probably the next step we as a community need to do. And I would hope that we can work together with DesignSafe and users like yourself, Yenlin, to kind of understand what would be the best way to create interfaces to visualize and navigate the data other than just downloading the whole project, right? Um, we have some limited ways to view it when you click on it, but some of our data is too big to engage in that way. And so I think maybe creating some user focus groups where people say, well, I would love to be able to click this and just visualize it in DesignSafe before downloading the whole thing. Or I'd love to be able to bring this into this tool in the, in the workbench and start working with it in DesignSafe. I think the more we understand how you want to consume it and interface with it once it's curated, it'll help us design the appropriate interfacing with, you know, with DesignSafe to actually make that capability uh, possible. And we are just in the new frontier of how people play with data and use it, right? Like we're, we're working so hard to get it that I think we need to engage with users like you to see now how do we make it easy for you to access it and start exploring it with DesignSafe as your hub. And so I think that's probably the next chapter. I'm sure Ellen and the team have some hopes of working with all of us to figure out that next chapter. Yeah, that ties in. I'll ask this one as the last question and then we'll close. So it ties into this question of what do you think about AI to help us for our goals? I mean, you're collecting a lot of data that has a pretty well-organized structure, which is really yeah. required for AI. So what do you think? Absolutely. And, you know, we've already been using it as training sets. You know, like one of these are said, do you only get damaged data? No, we have some perfectly good buildings too. So we could even use those for training recognition algorithms on undamaged buildings as well as damaged buildings. But part of the reason we make these giant data sets with over 100 fields is to give rich, you know, data that can be mined. Um, so yeah, it is truly our hope in our next generation of STEER, we're looking to automate a lot more of what we do. And we're hoping that we can 
have community members stand with us in, in thinking about how to use machine learning to really automate and make this more efficient. Our biggest challenge is steer is actually just moving the data efficiently and still have it be high quality. And the more we can automate that, the more we can do our job to serve the community better and getting the data through the pipeline faster. Um, so both for the analysis of the data, but even getting it to you all, we really hope to use automation and machine learning um, and other tools to, to really expedite that. And we're hopeful in our next proposal to NSF, they'll see the value in that and, and be helpful in investing in that next generation of STEER. All right, great. Thank you, Tracy, for the wonderful yeah. webinar. I really enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody who came to, um, to watch it. It's been recorded, so if you want to see it again, it'll be on the Design Safe website. I'd also just like to thank um, Ellen and Tim and Jamie and the whole Design Safe team and the ECO team. And, and I wanted to mention a few resources. So, um, of course, there's the help menu on Design Safe. If you have questions about any of these data sets, you can find all of Tracy's 39 published data sets on uh, the data in the data depot. Uh, we also have a Slack channel, so you can go there and ask questions and find other people who may have had similar questions that have already been answered in Slack. Uh, you can email us at training at designsafe-ci.org or fill out a ticket through the uh, Design Safe website. So with that, I'll thank Tracy one more time, and uh, I hope all of you have a great Veterans Day.